Welcome back to another episode of the Money Mentor Podcast with Chief Economist Dr. Andrew Wilson at My Housing Market. We've got plenty to unpack again on the Money Mentor Podcast. Uh, Doc's going to be going through all the data and giving us uh, some insights into why the housing market will continue to keep growing throughout 2024 and also beyond that. And um, it's good to have you back again, Doc. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, Glenn. Thank you for that. And uh, yes, more data today. Uh, probably a little bit extra, so we'll try to make sure we don't go too far over time. Um, but we've got uh, hot off the press today out of the ABS, the late inflation data. Um, probably not as good as the Reserve Bank would be hoping. We've sort of, uh, we've been preempting this a little bit over the last uh, month or so. Uh, a lot of this chat about cuts to interest rates in Australia are now really proving to be business. And, um, you know, it's just sort of more clickbait, I think, because the data's not heading in that direction in terms of... Uh, you know, the sort of outcomes the Reserve Bank would be wanting um, to see rates cut. So we have some interesting data. We have the latest inflation, as I said. Um, not great news there. We'll go through that. Um, we also have the latest uh, labour market data, which is also not great news for those looking for interest rate cuts. We've also got last weekend and clearance rates. And of course, last weekend, Glenn, as uh, you alluded to, we are on the cusp of Easter, Easter Friday this Friday. Happy Easter, everybody. Yes, we are. Happy um, Easter. But last weekend was the uh, Happy Easter, yeah? Don't eat too many Easter eggs, or, well, <laughs> at least not too, too many. But um, uh, but last week was the traditional pre-Easter holiday Super Saturday of auctions, and, boy, was it a Super Saturday. Let me tell you, Glenn, we had a mountain of auctions. We usually have that, but it was near record numbers of pre-Easter auctions so it was a big test for the market, obviously, with all those auctions. And we've had big tests all year so far, some, some extraordinary numbers of auction listings coming into the market. So we'll see what those results are. We've also had the latest population data. Still a bit right. backward looking at the data to September from the ABS on population. It's just really reinforcing what we already know in terms of the trends. So uh, if you like, we can get Let's going. Get it's a big day. Yeah. Brilliant. All right. So all good. So my housing market, of course, is my brand. I operate as an independent commentator and analyst for the housing market. And we are all about the current state and future prospects of your housing market, particularly the current state. So that's why we come to you every week in concert with uh, Infinity, our good friends at Infinity, um, to tell you what's happening this week in property, because it is a movable feast. Things are changing. Um, so we like to keep all our listeners and viewers up to date with the latest news. And uh, so let's get started on all that latest news, Glenn. Uh, the week ending Wednesday, March 27. Can you believe three months have gone already this year? So we've passed through the first quarter. Um, in fact, it's interesting. This is uh, prior to Easter. The first part of the market to Easter is what we call the first part of the autumn selling season. So it's the time when we can look back. We've had uh, a full, you know, a full period of auction activity, finishing Super Saturdays, and we've had enough data data coming through to give us a real feel for what's happening this year so far. Um, next week, we're going to, everybody get excited, please, because we're going to look at the latest house price and unit price data for the March quarter uh, coming up uh, on our uh, on our podcast next week. And I'm just preempting that because we do track data on a daily basis. There's going to be some very strong results. We shouldn't be surprised because auction markets have really been ticking over and we know auction results track house prices, et cetera, uh, and house prices track auction prices, et cetera. So uh, look forward to that next week. But uh, this week, we're going to have a look at uh, the latest labour market data, which was released last week. Um, some not good news there, as I said before, for the Reserve Bank, because our labour market strengthened again. This is mm. a boom economy, and it's just showing mm. no sign of slowing down, given all those interest rate increases. So those predicting you know, interest rate cuts, they wouldn't be uh, too happy with that data coming out. Latest population data, um, that's for the uh, September quarter from the ABS. It's the latest data. It's a little backward looking. It just reinforces what we know already, but we'll have a quick look at that. And hot off the press today, the latest inflation data. Again, not really good news for those looking for an interest rate cut anytime soon. I think we've got to stop talking about interest rate cuts because it's nonsense. And uh, those that are promoting that at the moment, uh, really, I think, are doing it for other reasons than, uh, you know, re reflecting what the data is telling us. And, of course, we will have, as usual, the latest weekend auction results 
for Super Saturday last weekend. So how did Super Saturday go? So let's start off with the inflation data. And inflation was higher, Glenn. Um, we've certainly seen an easing in inflation over the past year from those very high levels, decade high levels of inflation, of course was caused by the uh, mismatch between supply and demand through the COVID period. We had all those COVID stimulus packages. It created so much demand. That was what it was designed to do. No criticism there because yep. we were in uh, difficult times, uncertain times in regard to the lockdowns. Uh, um, so we threw the kitchen sink and everything else at the economy, record low interest rates uh, and a lot of fiscal stimulus, a lot of government spending. But, of course, we didn't have the supply to keep up with all that demand and that was a global phenomenon. And, of course, up went uh, prices and inflation went through the roof. And, of course, uh, reserve banks, central banks went to the usual place, decided we've got to control inflation because that can get out of control uh, quite easily, as we learnt from the 80s and the 70s. So they raised interest rates. And uh, we saw that interest rate increase regime really quite consistent through 22 and into 23. So it's very important to see how inflation is going at the moment because that is one of the keys to the outlook for interest rates. And let's remember last mm. year, Glenn, that we did have inflation uh, just tick up a little bit through the spring period. Um, we've discussed this. So we're going to look at that again. Mm -hmm. And then the Reserve Bank, after a period of very questionable steady results, um, were forced to move and put up interest rates again. Um, you know, maybe we're looking at that sort of scenario uh, eventuating here. I'm not saying that will happen, but uh, but certainly the drums are starting to think about beating in that direction. So inflation was higher over February. This is the latest February data. Uh, and we're talking about underlying inflation here, which is the result, which is the preferred measure of the Reserve Bank. It's the underlying inflation, which takes out some of the volatile bits and pieces. But headline inflation, which is the total inflation number was actually steady again. Now, this is the third month in a row, Glenn, that we've had inflation steady. So following all those sharp falls, we've had down and down and down. And the last fall we had was over November when we dropped nearly a percent from 4.3 to 3.4. We've actually had steady, steady, steady since then. And this is the point that, you know, I guess economists with some experience in this know, and that's the last little bit is always the hardest to sort mm. of... Uh, get on top of. So all the uh, sort of uh, hysterical predictions of, uh, you know, are we going to get back to the target range soon, so we should cut rates, you know, blah, 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 nonsensical stuff, because we've still got some hard yards to go before we get back to the target. So however, headline inflation was steady, um, but underlying inflation, which is the target, which is what the preferred measure of the Reserve Bank, was higher. It increased to 3.9% from 3.8%, which is not good news. Uh, and overall, that inflation outcome is not good news generally because it's flattened recently and underlying inflation was higher. Uh, housing, again, big contributor, up 4.6%, which was the same as the previous month. Uh, food down a little bit, up 3.6%. Uh, we're watching very carefully uh, fuel costs. If you notice that at the Bowser, we've seen fuel costs heading up over $2 a litre, which does reflect um, the, the impact of higher international oil prices. Uh, fuel was up 4.1%, which was higher than the previous month, which was up 3.1%. No uh, surprise there that upward pressure on inflation is coming from fuel uh, prices, which we've discussed here a number of times. And as I said, underlying inflation is still uh, well ahead of the RBA target of 2 to 3%, and, and really struggling now to get to that target range. So obviously, this is one month's data. It is starting to look like that bias is moving again towards perhaps another interest rate increase. Not saying that definitively. I think the outlook still is for steady rates. Um, but at the moment, we'd want to see some sort of improvement over the next couple of months. Now, when we looked at housing costs and we break that down, we still see that rent costs, according to the ABS, are rising sharply over 7% annual increase in rent costs. And of mm. course, here at My Housing Market, we track asking rents, which is the, the rents that are asked every uh, week, advertised rents. But what the ABS tracks is total rent. So that's people with, you know, that are renting already, not just those that are, not just the list, new listed rents, um, but also those that are on, you know, leases and longer term rents. And that takes some time to catch up, but it is now tracking at near record levels at 7% a year. So no real, uh, no real relief there. And as we saw last month, 
Um, house building costs are starting to rise again. We look forward to that data, which will come out next week, where we'll update house building costs. So, um, uh, you know, it's just uh, still neutral-ish, but looking not so good for uh, the thoughts that we've controlled inflation. I think we're still way up from there, and we have to keep a very careful eye on what's happening with fuel costs. So that's our inflation model. That's official, uh, oh, sorry, that's underlying inflation. And we can see we just picked up a little bit there, uh, Glenn, up to 3.9 after tracking uh, downwards quite consistently from a year ago where we were at 6.5%. So we have come down. Um, but our underlying inflation is still uh, at the level of the US, 3.9%. But our interest rates are actually a percent below the US, which is a bit of a concern there um, that uh, our rates are, are, are lower than the US rates, significantly lower but our inflation rate is still as high as the US. So um, uh, any sense of an in rate in a cut to interest rates, I think would have to follow the US because we're so far behind the US in terms of our interest rate cut that it would have repercussions if we cut and followed the US. So uh, that's the track for interest rates. Now we've done this before, Glenn, and we've looked at the price of oil. And we mentioned this today, the price of oil compared to the inflation rate. So you can see there, isn't that interesting that recently we've seen an uptick in the price of oil. We've also seen an uptick in inflation. So the price of oil does tend to track inflation, vice versa. Inflation tracks the price of oil. Even though there's some lagged effects there, it doesn't happen, even though it has happened recently in a more real-time environment, it doesn't necessarily follow that one month in oil, higher oil prices will mean one month of higher inflation. But there's certainly a relationship there particularly when we look at the uh, peaks to, to trough declines or to date from the peak declines, oil prices have fallen by around about 34% from their peak and uh, the CPI has fallen around about 44%. So similar shifts down. So we want to be very aware of what's happening with oil prices when we're looking at the outlook for inflation. And again, it was higher oil prices that contributed to uh, um, that more neutral uh, stance on uh, or that more neutral outcome on the inflation rate over February. So let's have a quick look at oil prices. And that's the latest oil price data. And, and you can see quite clearly that this year so far, oil prices have started to build a bit of a head of steam, started to rise, the trend is up, and they're now tracking over $80 US. So it's a question of whether they hold at around about $80 or whether that proves to be um, some sort of a resistance point or it starts to push upwards towards 90. Uh, if we do start getting towards 90, dollars US a barrel, it, it will have consequences for our inflation rate. Uh, as you can see from last year, when it went up towards 90 in October, I mentioned that reserve that pushed up inflation sharply and the Reserve Bank uh, acted and pushed up interest rates. So let's keep an eye on those oil prices, because if oil prices do start to push towards $90 US a barrel, uh, we may have some, we will have some issues in regard to um, uh, in regard to inflation. And even though we've seen oil pro uh, petrol prices over $2 a litre, uh, and, and it was, you know, it hasn't gone much above that, $2.20, $2.30, even when we've had oil, higher oil prices, it's because we've had government support on, on oil prices. Now, that's not there anymore. So the government may be forced to act if we do get above that $90 US a barrel, because there's going to be a lot of unhappy punters out there if we start looking Looking at two dollars fifty, two dollars sixty, maybe higher for the price mm. of petrol at the Bowser. So I uh, just put that one in, um, and it's uh, I think you know we're saying it as it is. Uh, not good news for mortgage holders in a sense, um, and uh, because it's certainly uh, you know will tend to push up uh, interest rates, but it, it certainly offsets any of that chat that's going on, which as I said, is a bit silly anyway regarding the prospect for near term cuts to interest rates. So that's the inflation data. Similarly, we didn't get any really great news with the latest unemployment data. Uh, this mm -hmm. is for February. Uh, we had a big, big, big result. Did I say big? Yes, I did. <laughs> a big result over February. Uh, the unemployment data. See, last month in January, and yeah, January, even though it's seasonally adjusted, can be yeah a little volatile. We do have issues, and the ABS has admitted it, with the uh, seasonal adjustment model. Maybe this is another example. But after rising to 4.1% over January, which was the first time over 4% in two years, Glenn, mm. um, we actually saw it 
heavily go backwards, uh, sharply down to 3.7%, near record low unemployment numbers. Jobs up by 116,000. Wow. Right. Jobs created over the month. Uh, um, unemployment fell. Number of unemployed fell by 52,000. Uh, the participation rate still near record levels was up slightly on the previous month, but very high. Mm. That measures the proportion of people who are working compared to the potential workforce. Uh, and New South Wales, still the lowest state for the jobless number. Um, again, another drop driver of that Sydney housing market is that very strong New South Wales economy. Um, and the jobless number still at this remarkably low level, despite all those interest rate increases, mm. 13 interest rate, done, it's done nothing. It's done nothing to uh, to slow down the economy. And it's been going, Glenn, for nearly two years, mate, right? Mm. And we still haven't yep. seen any real slowdown, which was predicted, you know, the nonsense that was predicted about those higher interest rates. Um, but, of course, another factor which was probably driving higher unemployment, was migration. But even though we've had record levels of migration, it, we've still got this very, very low unemployment rate. And this isn't good news because uh, employers will be struggling to find workers. That means they'll have to pay higher wages to secure workers. Uh, and that'll mean they'll have to likely put up prices to cover those high wages. Uh, and this is a good a concern, obviously, for the Reserve Bank. That we may, you know, continue to see some sense of a wages prices spiral with these very, very low, continuing very low unemployment rates, and we can see on the chart, look, three point seven. We've got to go back, God knows how long, the early seventies, to see the consistency in this uh, these low three percent plus unemployment rates, and um, you know, uh, a little volatile recently. It did look like finally those higher interest rates and high migration were impacting unemployment rates, but not, not this month. So, but look, we've got to wait till next month again. It's a little bit volatile, but certainly on this month's data, this is a boom, strong economy, mm. which can only put upward pressure uh, on inflation as employers struggle to find workers mm -hmm. and have to pay more with wages. And we've seen that with the latest wages data coming through. As I mentioned, New South Wales, uh, has the lowest unemployment rate. Unemployment rates are higher than where they were a year ago in every state except South Australia, where they're a little lower, and Western Australia, where they're flat. But they're still very low everywhere except Queensland in the threes, um, and Queensland's just on 4%. So New South Wales, the best performer of the states over February for the unemployment rate. Uh, I mentioned overseas migration. Um, we've got the latest data on overseas migration. You can see that huge turnaround from the COVID lockdown period where we shut our doors, nobody came in, we got no migrants, and then we opened our doors and here comes the flood. And we've seen this big r rise in uh, in migrant numbers. No surprise, of course. Um, and uh, we can see there the trends are still quite strong um, and uh, but, but easing slightly, but everywhere is experiencing very high levels, all the states, are uh, experiencing very high levels of annual net migration. So this is the difference between people coming in and people leaving, uh, not just permanents, but also temporary. So some big numbers there uh, continuing. That's the annual growth trend. Uh, and when we look at the breakdown, this is interesting, Glenn, we can see, and we haven't had the state's numbers come up there, but number one is New South Wales. Number two is Victoria. Three is Queensland. Uh, four is South Australia. Five is Western Australia. So a little bit of, a little bit of code there. Uh, um, but uh, New South Wales is still the states for overseas net migration. Normally, we mm. see Victoria as the big uh, as the destination for overseas net migration, but New South Wales continues to attract big numbers of uh, net overseas migrants. I think this is one of the factors. This is over the year ending uh, September. This is one of the big factors that's uh, been driving that Sydney housing market, a lot of my net migration coming in, particularly expats, Glenn. I think mm. a lot of expats over the past year or so have come back into Sydney. And I think that's why we're, as part of the story, part of the story of why we've seen continuing strong housing market activity in, uh, in New South Wales. I think Victoria will eventually catch up, which is sort of good news for that Victorian housing market, which is still an underperformer compared to, well, the Melbourne housing market compared to the other capitals. Uh, the major capitals, but uh, still good numbers coming through into Victoria there. But typically, it's the leader of net overseas migration, but still trailing New South Wales on the annual results. Mm. And of course, we do speak about just how strong that Queensland market is at the moment. 
particularly, well, all regions really in southeast Queensland are very strong. And you can see one of the forces there clearly is migration. Look how net migration has boomed into Queensland. These are remarkable figures. They're like more than double what it was pre to pre COVID, you know, 2020. And even pre COVID continued to rise because of all that interstate migration that shifted into, uh, into Queensland from New South Wales and Victoria. Um, even though they were losing, as everybody else, net uh, overseas migration because of lockdowns. But, uh, uh, yeah, 120,000 over the year to uh, September. A lot of that, of course, is still that impact from the year before uh, from the surge out of uh, Melbourne and Sydney into southeast Queensland. But this is clearly still a, uh, it's still growing, and this is clearly a, a driver of higher prices and rent and higher demand in those, particularly those southeast Queensland markets. We're talking Brisbane. Sunshine Coast and particularly the Gold Coast. So let's have a look at the weekend auction markets. Glenn, are you excited? Let's We've do got it, uh, the Super Saturday results. Let's do it. And of course, the reason we look, as I mentioned before, is that we get this very clear correlation between house price growth and clearance rates. You can see it there. Higher clearance rates, higher house prices, lower clearance rates, lower house price growth. And that's for Sydney. Same deal in Melbourne there, same relationship. So it's always handy, very handy. Andy, uh, to look, if you're interested in what's happening in the market in real time, to look at those Saturday night uh, results for the auction markets, because they do give us a great uh, indicator of, of what's happening broadly in our housing market. So last weekend was Super Saturday. Yeah, I think I invented that term. Do you know, <laughs> you know that? A long time ago. I was the first with the Super Saturday, and now everybody talks about Super Saturday. You know, uh, retailers, sports events are all Super Saturday. No, it all started... I think with me about the Super Saturday of auctions, uh, which we, we've been promoting for the best part of 15 years or more. So latest weekend auction results, it was Super Saturday. Super Saturday is called that because we do have a big front end loading of auctions with vendors and agents who are trying to avoid, avoid the lengthy Christmas break. So the Saturday before Easter is typically one of the biggest, if not the biggest auction days of the week, of the year. It, it sort of uh, ends the pre of the uh, early part of the auction selling season. So a lot of the planning for those that have done it earlier in the year for an auction sale happens the months before that, um, and they all work so that they will avoid the clash with the Easter holidays where obviously people are distracted, the buyers are distracted over that period. So we had a big number. No surprise, there, there was near record numbers. When you see the numbers, you'll, uh, you'll probably uh, nearly faint, Glenn, I think, because <laughs> they're so high. But nonetheless, uh, we'll, we'll go through it anyway. We'll take the chance. Uh, but relative, but interestingly enough, clearance rates remained relatively steady. So it was a big test for the market, unprecedented, mm -hmm. almost unprecedented numbers of auctions, which we've had this year. It's been an incredible year, and we'll have a look at some data relating to that shortly. Um, but uh, the first part of that autumn selling season has now finished. We'll have a little bit of a break over Easter, well, a big break, and then, of course, we have Anzac Day. A lot of people will take leave uh, between that Easter and Anzac Day period, perhaps, so it's a bit of a distracted market through April, as it always is, because it's April's the holiday month. Uh, but we have had record numbers of listings, not just for Super Saturday, but the whole way through this early part of the auction, uh, the early autumn selling season. Uh, and it's also translated into record numbers of sales. Now, let's just say this, that we've had an early Easter. So really, we won't know until May and how we've actually gone compared to the real year-on-year -year comparisons, because we've had an um, earlier Easter which has brought forward a lot of listings. Um, so will it still remain at record levels once we get through the full month of April? Well, let's wait and see for that. But certainly to this point in time, we've had remarkable numbers of properties going under the hammer, uh, and that creates confidence with other sellers, right? Um, and buyers certainly haven't been missing out because the buyers are all still there um, because clearance rates have been good. So let's have a look at the numbers. Sydney, big, big weekend of auctions, 1,136 auctions. Uh, in Sydney, uh, clearest the, the the one of the biggest for a while in Sydney. Uh, clearance rates were actually higher in Sydney last weekend than the weekend before, despite over having a thousand having over eleven hundred auctions. Clearance rates were very positive for most sellers, seventy five point three percent. So that's telling us that three quarters of the properties that were put under the hammer uh, were actually sold. So good result there. In fact, a great result there for Sydney. Mm -hmm. As I said, no surprise that we're we're looking at strong price results for Sydney over the first uh, three quarters of, of the first quarter, three months of this year. Look for those results next week. So 75% clearance rate in Sydney. 
Uh, and the auction numbers, 300 extra auctions compared to the weekend before. So it was a big load. Lots of choices for buyers, lots of competition for sellers, sorry, for sellers and lots of buy competition for buyers and a higher clearance rate, which is quite uh, fantastic for those sellers. Uh, auction numbers, last weekend wasn't Super Saturday over the same weekend. So it's a little bit of a, not a great comparison for numbers, but auction clearance rates are tracking well below, well above where they were a year ago in Sydney. So really a positive outcome. Look at that Melbourne auction numbers, 1,516 auctions in Melbourne, near record number of uh, Super Saturday auctions in Melbourne, over 1,500. Melbourne clearance rates held the line. Melbourne has been an underperformer uh, compared to the other capitals this year uh, and really over the last nine months or so and for prices. Um, uh, still growing, but not at the uh, faster rates of Brisbane, Adelaide, Sydney and Perth, but uh, a steady rate for Melbourne despite having... Uh, a big load of auctions and the weekend before as well. So unprecedented numbers of auctions coming through into that Melbourne market for the pre-Easter period, near unprecedented, and still holding their own in terms of clearance rates, which is still a reasonable result for sellers. So certainly not as strong as the other markets. And you can see the clearance rates a little bit lower than where it was a year ago uh, in, in Melbourne. Now, Brisbane, big weekend in Brisbane, 130 auctions. Clearance rates around about the same as the weekend before and around about the same as the same weekend last year. We know that Brisbane uh, clearance rate is always a bit misleading because Brisbane's have a different, Brisbane has a different sort of auction culture to the other uh, auction cultures, marketing cultures, particularly Melbourne and Sydney. They tend to uh, look at uh, the auction market uh, marketing as a bit of an entree to maybe mm -hmm. a private sale. So you don't get as high a clearance rates typically, although we did have huge clearance rates a year ago when Brisbane was certainly booming. Um, but nonetheless, that's a good result for Brisbane. Uh, Adelaide, uh, down a little bit. Adelaide just hasn't had quite the uber boom, if I could call it that, the super boom results of 80 to 90% uh, that we got last year, but still a good result from 122 auctions, 70.6%, but down a little bit on the weekend before and also the same Saturday last year. Like I said, Adelaide's still performing well for most sellers, but not in that really outrageous 80 to 90% realm that we've been used to. Now, Canberra's the interesting one, Glenn. We've been saying this for a while now, you heard it first here, yep. that there certainly has been early signs of the Canberra market picking up. Mm. Uh, it was a clear underperformer from the middle of last year. Um, some government policies there, I think, perhaps affected confidence. Uh, it didn't follow Sydney upwards as it typically does. It just sort of remained pretty flat. Um, but we've seen some early signs over the last month or so that Canberra just starting to build some momentum, perhaps those value opportunities now appealing to buyers. Um, but uh, Canberra had a, a big number of auctions, 96 pre-Easter auctions, a 66.7% clearance rate in Canberra, which is the mm. biggest for a while in Canberra. And certainly, you know, we haven't seen many clearance rates above 60% in Canberra for quite some time. So that was a really positive result, uh, particularly given how many auctions we had. And you can see how, you know, 10% higher than the weekend before and 10% higher than the same time last year. And, of course, once you start getting above 60%, 65%, it is starting to work in favour of sellers. Mm. Um, so we would expect some higher price growth going forward. And that's, but I think Canberra's, you know, really stands out there as a reviving market, whereas the other markets are, are really holding their own. It's been a very strong period um, uh, for, uh, for auctions over March. And we can compare the March data with Sydney last year, uh, Sydney tracking ahead of where it was a year ago. Uh, Melbourne, a little bit down, about 5% down on the March clearance rate uh, last year compared to this year uh, over March. Uh, Brisbane, similar, a little higher compared to a year ago. Um, and Adelaide, yes, similar, a little lower, as we mentioned, that Adelaide mark over March. But uh, the next few months will tell the story in Adelaide because that was when it was super strong a year ago with those 80 to 90% uh, clearance rates. And Canberra, as I mentioned, a bit of a dodgy slide there, but it's certainly now tracking above 60% for the first time since uh, June last year, well, since the middle of last year. And as we saw, it it, it did fall away uh, through the uh, spring market last year. Now it's starting to show some signs of revival. We'll watch out to see if uh, if that's a consistent revival going forward. So if you're looking for those uh, auction clearance rate data to keep an eye on what's happening in real time in the market, we have the Capital City Snapshots Every Saturday night at 6.30 p.m., around 6.30 p.m. on my LinkedIn account, Doc Andrew Wilson at LinkedIn. And Sunday mornings, you can get the full national report, which includes regional breakdowns for Sydney and Melbourne. Hang on to your hats because we're going to be releasing an auction app soon. 
where you'll be mm. able to see the performance of the top suburbs and top regions and the top prices uh, of uh, 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 up to the year to date. Uh, so you can see how suburbs are performing in terms of the auction market. And we're also going to show where the top auction or who the top auction agents are as well. So Very good, uh, look out for that one, some more, more positive insights. And we'll look at that maybe next week, Glenn. We'll look at where the top uh, uh, performers have been on a suburb, regional and agent basis in each of the capitals. Beautiful. That'll be some good insights for uh, buyers and sellers out there. So uh, let's have a look, just comparing this year to last year, um, Glenn. So this is the first, uh, this is March last year compared to March this year. Uh, sorry, the year to date to March um, to, to now, which is to the 4th of uh, February when we start our auctions. So it's the, the, the weeks up to uh, last weekend compared to the same period last year. In Sydney, we've had nearly 50% more sales. So mm. this isn't clearance rates. This isn't listings. This is the actual number of sales. So this is probably a little bit more relevant if you think about it. Uh, so we're seeing a big surge in sales, uh, nearly 50% more sales in Sydney so far this year compared to the same time last year, 30% more sales in Melbourne mm. compared to the same time last year. These are weekend auction sales. Brisbane up nearly 40% in terms of auction sales so far this year compared to the same period last year. Adelaide up 15% in Canberra, now up by uh, nearly 6%. So... Uh, I guess good news for governments with their stamp duty that they're seeing these extra sales. Good news for agents because they'll be getting a little bit more commission coming through with more sales. So uh, I think this is very interesting insights in terms of um, the number of actual auction sales that have occurred so far this year. So we don't, you know, no real surprise uh, if we do get a surge in prices coming through when we release the official uh, or our official March quarter data next week um, for all our capital city markets. So if you do want a copy of that uh, latest National Weekend Auction Market Report, there is a QR code which you can take a picture of and it'll get you the latest uh, Weekend Auction Market Report. As I said, it features the um, uh, regional and suburb breakdowns and top, uh, top sales for Melbourne and Sydney. Uh, we've mentioned where you can get that data from already. Uh, we finish off by mentioning our wonderful My Housing Market Infinity Suburb Data app. If you want to find out, which has just been updated and refreshed. Um, so we're now we're covering even more suburbs. Not that we weren't covering all suburbs, but we've just up updated that and refreshed it. Um, and uh, there's a, a QR code if you want to get a copy of that app. But it has is password protected, and the password is protected by Infinity. So you have to go through Infinity to get a hold of that app. Uh, to get access to that app, there's the link to it there, and there's the QR code. It's a great little app, isn't it, Glenn? Because yep, it covers sure is, all of Australia's suburbs. It's updated, uh, you know, regularly, daily basis. And um, uh, it, if you're like wanting to find out what's happening in the rental market or the uh, the price market, the sales market, uh, it's a great indicator because it does show what's for sale uh, and what's for rent currently in those markets. And there's a screenshot just as an example of what you what you get of the app. Um, you can filter it for price or rent. You can filter it for state and capital city regions. Um, we've done that. Uh, we filtered it for price, New South Wales, Sydney. You can also filter it for New South Wales Regional, which gives you the regional suburbs. We filtered it for New South Wales, Sydney. We've looked at Blacktown, which is a big suburb uh, in Sydney, of course, a large region. We filtered it for house. You can also filter it for townhouse or unit. You can also filter it for the number of beds as well. So we filtered it for for a five-bedroom house in Blacktown. When we search, we find that the current median is 1.245 million. The low is, so we don't just get the median asking price. These are asking prices. Uh, so it's up to date. It's not looking back at sales data. Um, the low currently at 990 and the high of 1.5 million in Blacktown. And there are currently nine houses for sale in Blacktown. So uh, look out for an update on that one with our next presentation as well. You can also do exactly the same thing for the rental market. And we've done exactly the same filtering house, uh, Blacktown, five beds, and we can see the median rent there is $600 a week. The low is $570 and the high is $700. And there's only four properties for, the, for rent houses, five bedroom houses for rent in Blacktown. But that's no surprise. So get a hold of that. Uh, great little app. And uh, we are going to be adding some new features to this app. Uh, we may put the auction info into that one, but we're certainly going to have yield data which will be great news for investors. So you'll be able to identify 
the yields uh, of the uh, and also the top performing yields, which is always a good um, uh, indicator for uh, investment strategies, is where the where the top performing gross. I'm excited, Doc. Are. It's a great so piece next of week, tech. Glenn. And, yes, I know. I can tell. Yes, I know it is, and it's only getting better, mate. So it's only getting better. Correct. Um, but through infinity, of course, you have to get hold of that, and it's you can put it on your phone. You can just carry it around, and it'll tell you what's happening. If you're interested in a suburb, you can find out what's for sale there. Or, you know how many listings are there, so that tells you the level of competition, uh, the high, not just the median price, but the high and the low price. So you can figure out the range of prices, and you can figure out. You can also look at uh, total bedrooms, or five, four, three, two, one bedrooms, or for units one, two, or three bedrooms and total bedrooms. And you can do that for every suburb in Australia which actually has data. So going forward on that. So next weekend, I've already alluded, we've got the latest uh, home price data. Some big news there going forward. Um, everybody should be catching up with that one. Uh, the latest, we're going to look at the housing market cycle again mm. with that updated prices. We're also now going to include on the housing market cycle, Glenn, the smaller markets of Hobart, Canberra and Darwin. So we're going to include those right. on our housing market cycle model. So look okay. out for that one uh, coming through for the first time. Uh, and that will reflect our latest prices from next week. Latest retail sales, again, an important data set in terms of the outlook for interest rates. Um, and we don't have any, any real auctions this weekend because it is the Easter long weekend, long, long weekend. So there's going to only be a handful of auctions. Some, some, there are some going on, but not, you know, not, not really a reliable data set. We might have a look at results, but what we will do is look at the top auction regions over March. Should be a new one we're going to start looking at, which is which are the top auction regions in each of the capital cities. So who's had the most auctions, which region, and which region has had the most, the highest clearance rates. We're also going to look at the suburbs with the highest clearance rates in each of the capitals. And we're also going to look at the top agents. So which agent mm -hmm. has had the most auction listings in each of our capital city markets? So we'll look at the top five uh, auction agents in each of the uh, capital cities. We can also get the top clearance rates, but I'm not sure we'll do that for the agents, but we'll certainly look at the top uh, the top number of listings for agents. So it never ends, Glenn. If you want all the insights into the housing market, this is where you get it first, and you certainly get comprehensive and reliable and robust data sets. Beautiful. So if you want this report, a copy of the report, there's the QR code, which you can uh, take a little bit of a look at. And of course, it'll be up on uh, all your favourite pod, uh, podcasting venues. And uh, as usual, we're here with the first and the latest on a week-by-week -week basis. So there's the report um, to uh, to get a copy of, or there's the QR code to get a copy of the full report today. Uh, and there's our brand, and that's us for today. Beautiful, Doc. Uh, Glenn, it's a busy day, and my voice is held up because I've got over the lurgy, thank the Lord. Um, and uh, again, we, we, here we are, we're off again next, next week with another big show, I'm sure. Well, it will be because we've got a late... We've got the price data coming through. So um, uh, as I've said at the beginning, I hope everybody has a great Easter. Don't eat too, too many Easter eggs, but <laughs> if you can't help it, fair enough. Uh, and if you're on holidays, have a good break as well. Thanks for your time again, Doc. Have a great Easter.